Next, I'm introducing the Honourable Lawrence Springboard, uh, who is, many of us know, everyone I'm sure knows, the Minister for Health. He was sworn in as Queensland's Minister for Health on the 3rd of April 2012 and is a former leader and deputy leader of the opposition in Queensland. At 21 years of age, he was the youngest person ever elected to the Queensland Parliament as member for Carnarvon in 1989. He was born in Inglewood the, um, and he was brought up on a small mixed farming property close to Queensland, New South Wales border, where um, his Linda and his four children uh, live today. He has a strong interest in reading, political history and astronomy, an interest that drove him to build his own observatory, and he's also a keen beekeeper. I've been to about uh, six forums where the minister has actually spoken and I didn't know those two aspects about him. But what I do know is that he's a fabulous proponent for maternity services. I think he's probably the best minister for health for maternity services we've ever had in Australia. And I'm not saying that just because you're sitting here, but um, we've learnt quite a lot about his stories with the rural maternity forums that um, he's had and why he's such a proponent for actually returning birthing services and strengthening birthing services across all of Queensland and in particular in rural and remote areas. Um, welcome, Minister. Thank you very much, Sue, for that very uh, warm and effusive uh, introduction. And uh, I, I did have a couple of very, very uh, solid interests uh, before I went into Parliament. One was uh, politics, another one was astronomy, and I was uh, building my own observatory. And as I've gone into uh, Parliament, all of those fantastic things that I spent my time learning as a, a young person and, uh, and teaching myself with regards to uh, the wonders of the universe, I've probably uh, forgotten more than I've actually uh, learned occasionally. I I now get the uh, telescope out and actually uh, show the, uh, the children uh, through it and it's, I've seen some absolutely amazing things that have happened over a period of time including uh, a few years ago with the first ever known comet impact on, on Jupiter happened around about 12 to 15 years ago and actually saw that impact it was just amazing with my telescope and recently my wife and I uh, went to Iceland on a bit of a tour because I wanted to see something that I'd never seen in my life and I've been aspiring to since I was four or five years of age believe it or not you probably wonder what sort of a childhood that actually mesmerised me but uh, I said to my wife uh, a few months ago, would you like to go to Iceland uh, in the middle of their winter to actually see the northern lights? And she said, I suppose, you know, if we don't spend enough time together if I've got to go there to spend some time with you. It's Iceland, that'll be fine. So we did see the northern lights. It was an amazing display. Uh, can I also uh, acknowledge uh, you, Auntie Valder, and just say it's always a pleasure and a privilege to actually hear you speak and the passion from where you come, not only for your community but of course for uh, your people and their amazing contribution to our land. And I acknowledge uh, your words and I certainly acknowledge that amazing uh, contribution from yourself and also uh, from uh, Indigenous people as well. Can I acknowledge each and every one of you, ladies and gentlemen, because uh, many of you are very special guests and you have a very special commitment to the issue of improving child and maternal welfare. But very importantly today, the strong focus about around here is around uh, better outcomes and better opportunities for Indigenous mothers wherever they live uh, in Queensland. And, and of course, that's very diverse. Uh, not only, of course, in the rural and regional areas of Queensland, but also a predominantly large Indigenous population in the more urbanised environments as well. And while the issues um, may be very much similar, the way that the services delivered are also similar, but the challenges can also be a little bit different along the way. I myself have a very, very strong commitment to the enhancement and delivery of uh, birthing services around Queensland because of where I've come from, a rural area where I was born and the opportunities that were provided to my wife and myself and I actually saw a loss of those particular services just as our children were born and what I always understood and knew as a child and with my mother and experience with our first children was a very, very safe and supportive environment where we had our local midwives and nurses that provided an amazing experience and of course overseen by uh, a local uh, general practitioner. And I've been very keen to make sure that we can rebuild and provide that opportunity of choice for women around Queensland. And that's what we are doing, and I'm very much committed to that. And, and as a part of that, we have to make sure that we uh, competently uh, rebuild what are safe services for women. And safe services don't necessarily mean that they have to be delivered in our largest tertiary hospitals around Queensland. It's appropriate model. <laughs>
It's appropriate models of care and appropriately delivered based on evidence. And false evidence and false proposition has been used over a long period of time to dismantle access to health services around Queensland. And now we're using evidence to actually build it back the other way. And the Centre for Mothers and Babies are absolutely crucial in that. And I uh, commend uh, uh, Sue for her fantastic work in that area as well. And many others that have been involved in that particular process. That's why we've made a commitment to reopen birthing services at Bow Desert, which is going to happen ahead of time. That's why we've made a commitment to reopen birthing services in Cooktown. That's why we're making commitments to reopen those particular services in other areas around Queensland. And you might ask, why is this important to uh, Indigenous women around Queensland? Well, it's very, very important because if we're going to provide more opportunities to women with a continuity of care, a midwifery continuity of care, with greater choices for them, and as we move towards birthing on country, that we need to make sure that we have that backup and support and capability for women wherever they live around Queensland. And ladies and gentlemen, I don't actually have uh, any great expectation that we will be able to uh, reopen and provide the service where everyone's heart desires around Queensland. But we need to provide greater opportunity where people are comfortable in their area. And I understand the important connection that women in general have to their own local families, their own local communities and their opportunities to be delivered locally. For Indigenous women, uh, because of what has been an historical, generational, a multi-millennium connection, it's even far more important and what we have to do is to recognise that and we need to make sure that women have safe available opportunities. And we know uh, midwifery-led models, a continuity of care models, can give really, really good outcomes. In many cases, a better outcome with regards to uh, perinatal outcomes and a whole range of other indicators than just actually uprooting a woman and taking her away in the last three, four, five weeks of her pregnancy to somewhere else. We know that. The evidence actually says that. And, uh, you know, the immimitable Tiger Bale said to me a moment ago, look, now women have been doing this for thousands of years, so we should be able to keep doing it out there and do it. And philosophically, agree. But we've also got to make sure that uh, it's also safe because our expectations today are that we want a birthing experience that goes right basically 100% of the time. Now we know for vagaries of the whole birthing experience, which is, uh, you know, can be an amazing experience, but it's quite a traumatic experience for mother and baby, it can be, uh, things can go wrong. We understand those sorts of things. And indeed, we have one of the best, if not the best, maternal survival rate in the whole wide world here in Queensland in Australia. And whilst the trends are actually going the other way around the rest of the world, we've actually held that. If you look at maternal death rates in Australia, they're exceptionally low. You know, uh, in the low tens or even sub tens um, for the general population out of 100,000. Now, one mother's too many, but sometimes things go wrong which are beyond. If you go back 50 or 100 years ago, whatever the case may be, the number of women that actually died in childbirth, we all know people who actually did. You know, in our own families, when you're talking about numbers in the hundreds, not numbers in the 100,000s. So as we move to provide those opportunities, we have to make sure that we do not compromise the safest environment for our women. And that's where continuity of care, that's where midwifery models actually come in because they build confidence and capability in the community and also amongst women. So they know and they actually trust if they need to actually escalate their birthing experience that they can do that in full confidence. And that's what this is all about. We are very committed as a, a state government to uh, investing, to working with uh, the community controlled organisations. But it's on the basis of evidence. We know that uh, many of these things work and work exceptionally well. And I salute those that have been involved in uh, community control as well over, over such a long period of time. And also the wonderful organisations that actually oversee and, and, and as the collective there and their wonderful policy uh, advoc advocacy, the Indigenous uh, Institute, um, Urban Institute, uh, uh, a Quake as well, uh, do absolutely fantastic work. And over the last 12 months, uh, the state government has committed $800,000 um, through to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Council 
and the Urban Indigenous Institute up to $4 million. We will continue to invest uh, in building sustainable uh, models of healthcare delivery, and they have to be sustainable uh, business models to provide the best outcome uh, for women and indeed uh, patients in general uh, who like the community control model and the continuity and the connectivity that comes with uh, the delivery of Indigenous health through what is a model of health care which is, which, is which is more relevant. Indeed, our commitment under the National Partnership Agreement for Indigenous and Early uh, Childhood Development has been some $21 million. Uh, some more money has been uh, contributed there as well. The Commonwealth have put a similar amount in, so we're very much committed. But money is not the way of actually just solving this. It's what you do with your money which is the most important. And we've got to go away from looking at inputs to outcomes, what's actually being delivered for those people out there. Now, I'm not into a tokenism when it comes to delivering health care anywhere around Queensland. I actually stand for what I say and you can judge me on what I actually deliver and that's the most important thing and that's why we've done what we've done in birthing in general, our commitment to uh, those traineeships and scholarships for uh, midwives in the last uh, few months building up to 50 positions uh, by the end of this year, that's about rebuilding our workforce, rolling out what is the midwifery group uh, practice model around Queensland and then building capability for uh, birthing on country, all of those sorts of things and there has been some really uh, encouraging indicators in the area of, the, of, of, of what we need to achieve with regards to closing the gap. Well, I can tell you, ladies and gentlemen, it needs to be a, a lot better than what it is. It needs to be a lot better than what, I, what it is. Even though, relatively, we've come a long way in the, in the Indigenous and non-Indigenous community over the last few generations, we've got a long way to go. Whilst you know, the life expectancy for the general population, on average, has gone up significantly in the last hundred odd years and even the indigenous one, it's still a significant gap. The relative gap is still there and we need to be doing more as well with regards to the issue of um, uh, chronic disease, some of the other lifestyle issues, some of these things which are even a greater preponderance in the indigenous community. Uh, the birth weights of babies, smoking, um, alcohol during pregnancy, all of those things. Problem in the community generally? bit more of a problem in the Indigenous community because we know that uh, a mum who is taking those particular precautions during pregnancy will actually deliver a healthier baby and require less intervention and they're very crucial as we move towards expanding birthing options for women around Queensland and the continuity of care options and we've got to get that message through and I don't know how we do it in the general community let alone the Indigenous community and somebody asked me yesterday, I was talking to a group of young people who aspire to a career in healthcare from schools over at the Wesley Hospital and one of the young women there said to me, she's probably around about 16 or 17 years of age, um, she's wanting to be, a, I think, a doctor, may have been a nurse. She said, uh, for you, if you could change one thing, what would it be? And I said, greater self-responsibility when it comes to health care. People actually, you know, we've got the messages out there. You do this all the time fantastically well. The figures around the world are 40 per cent of people don't take any notice of what the doctor or nurse tells them across the community. So it makes you wonder sometimes, so if we didn't drink during pregnancy, if we stopped smoking altogether, if we ate a bit better, if we exercised a bit more, it would make an enormous uh, difference in the life. And we know the consequence of fetal alcohol syndrome. We know the consequence of smoking in pregnancy. And we've got to keep embedding those, uh, those, um, those messages. But it's not just about health care. It's also about people with hope and opportunity. And if you provide hope and opportunity, there is a much greater alignment around aspiration and self-responsibility and those sorts of things as well. Um, we've done a lot in investing in uh, mums and bubs policy to take make, making sure that women have that continuity of care uh, after the birthing experience with uh, someone who can turn up and help them assist them because you need that bit of skilling at that particular stage. And we're doing that and we're now seeing thousands and thousands of more mothers uh, than what we were previous to rolling that out. I won't labour the points, ladies and gentlemen, but just say there are some encouraging signs. Uh, we're going to have to keep doing more. There are no uh, silver bullets with regards to this. Uh, you're working exceptionally hard. But ultimately, community empowerment and, and relevance and relationships are the most important ways to deliver these things. 
And I think that if people can see that we're doing our side of the thing, then they may even be prepared to do more uh, on their part. But thank you very much for uh, what you do. Wish you all the very best with uh, the discussions today. And also congratulations to uh, those that have been involved in the signing of this fantastic agreement today, the Community Controlled Organisations and, and MARTA. Thank you very much uh, for uh, what you do do. But uh, I will continue to maintain uh, my passion. We will give you the enablers. Hopefully it will keep making a difference. Thank you.